Why did all Europe, except England, adopt Roman law? What were the church courts, and what cases did they hear? What is a leet, and why is there a court dedicated to it? These and other questions will be answered right after this. I am Professor Jerome Markenberg, and I've been teaching a wide variety of history courses at colleges across this country for the past 30 years. In this video, I'm going to tell you about, first, the church courts, also known as the Courts Christian, and their jurisdiction. Second, why England, unlike the rest of Europe, did not adopt Roman law. Third, the rules and course of action for civil lawsuits in medieval England, and finally, the various courts of medieval England, including King's Bench, Common Pleas, Chancery, Exchequer of Pleas, Heirs, Assize, Quarter Sessions, County Courts, Hundred Courts, Manorial Courts, Courts Elite, and Pie Potter Courts. At the end, I'll have the wrap-up quote on this video. But first, make sure to click like, share, and especially subscribe, and that little bell thingy, so I can continue to bring you more great videos just like this one. By the 12th century, a hierarchy of church courts, also known in England as the Courts Christian, had developed from the local courts of every bishopric, of every bishop, to kind of supreme court run by the primate, the primate of the realm, with final appeal to the Pope in Rome. Though in these courts, defendants had the burden of proof of their innocence, that is, they were guilty until proven innocent. Now, these courts had jurisdiction over all cases involving, one, trespasses and breaches of the peace around all churches. Second, tithes and church property. Third, benefices and advowsons. Fourth, legal affairs and property of all secular and regular clergy. Fifth, legal affairs and property of all widows, orphans, and the needy. Sixth, all regular and secular clergy accused of any crime whatsoever. Seventh, adultery. Eighth, premarital sex, also known as fornication. Ninth, divorce. Tenth, marriage. Eleventh, burial. Twelfth, perjury. Thirteen, all contracts using oaths. Fourteen, slander and libel, or other words, defamation. Fifteen, witchcraft, heresy, sacrilege, and blasphemy. Fifteen, wills of personal property. And sixteen, Usury. Now, outside of England, medieval states followed Roman law after the 14th century, in part because it elevated the ruler to supremacy over regional dukes, counts, barons, and other lords, in part because it was a neutral and far more highly developed system than the existing feudal law in most countries. In England, however, royal, or what's called common law, first restricted to the area of the king's household, regulating crimes and civil disputes of free men, gradually extended to the entire realm. 
and you can look at this chart here on your own time. The common law derived from many sources and traditions, both custom and statutes. So Anglo-Norman, Norman, Roman, Biblical, and church law, developing unlike the rest of Europe, in part because, well, England's feudal law developed so precociously that by the time Roman law was adapted to and ready for medieval life, English common law was already far advanced and had a class of legal professionals with a vested interest to maintain it intact. And again, James the First of England tried to force Roman law on England and the English just would not have it. Now, actions in the king's courts began with a plaintiff buying a particular writ for a particular kind of action from the chancery. And after Magna Carta, the writ was issued as a matter of course. So in other words, as long as you bought it, it had to be issued and put, had the great seal put on it. The king, the chancellor, the clerk couldn't just say no to you. The writ was then issued to the sheriff in the county where the claimed wrong had been done, ordering that sheriff to serve the writ on the named defendant or show cause why the sheriff had not done so on penalty of law. Example, the defendant is dead. After the sheriff had served the writ, it was returned to the chancery with a note of the action taken. And the case was set for hearing at a certain date and time at which time the defendant personally, or by an agent known as an attorney, appeared at the bar of the court, and the plaintiff personally, or by his attorney, stated the counts. Now, this word count is French for tale or story. So the plaintiff, or his attorney, would state the counts in his complaint as per the writ. Now, if you've had any dealings with civil actions in America, it should sound very familiar to you, and there's a reason for that. Now, originally any male, sorry, no females, only the male, any male, friends, neighbors, relatives, a superior, boss, inferior, whatever, could serve as one's attorney until the late 14th century, though increasingly professionals did the job from 1300 onwards. So this attorney would represent their clients in litigation, managing suits for them, taking out writs, and instructing counters in the facts. The counters were those who said the count. Remember, that's the Taylor story, much like a modern solicitor. Each count had to be stated correctly in one's pronouncement with no slip-ups. And if you did slip up, the entire action was dismissed which is why by 1290, professionals called counters, later these will be called barristers, but at first they were called counters, had emerged, whose specialty was composing the counts, which they had to pronounce them correctly in court from memory. And they increasingly did the job rather than the plaintiff. Nowadays, of course, each count is written on paper, you could still object to it, but it's done in a very different way. The defendant, more and more through his counter, then either pled no contest to the counts, all of them or only some of them, 
or pled exceptions to them or denied them entirely, after which the plaintiff and defendant responded to each other's counts back and forth, back and forth, until differences of fact were agreed to be presented to a jury, kind of like jury instructions, in what was called a Nisi Prius trial in the Assize Courts. So all of the action at the main court in Westminster was done not about presenting evidence, but simply arguing over what the counts, are they accurate, are they not accurate, and agreeing what is at issue so that that at issue could then be presented to the trier of fact, the juror, the jury. Given the importance of the counters in shaping the law, by the year 1300, the king's justices, all of them, had to be counters, as they had to be as skilled in substance and procedure as the counters who appeared before them. During the 14th century, the counters who had achieved a monopoly of practice in a court of common pleas organized themselves into a guild called the sergeants at law, who were given the same socio-legal status as knights by King Edward III. These sergeants at law, who also had the right to plead, but not exclusively, in the Court of King's Bench and the Exchequer of Pleas, had their own guild hall, the sergeants in, and were distinguished in court by the wearing of a white silk coif. Coifs were common in medieval England, but this was a special coif, white silk, which was tied under the chin. There, of course, is a picture of sergeants in. This is not certainly not the medieval version. Sergeants in as it looked in 1820. I have not been able to find any earlier ones. Originally, the only court in England was the Curia Regis, or King's Court, you might call it the King's Council, really, made up of the King's advisors and courtiers who followed the King about the countryside, which caused problems when the King was in France or on campaign. This was remedied during the late 12th century when the Exchequer of Pleas and the Court of Common Pleas were split off and given a fixed abode in Westminster Hall as required by Magna Carta. Now, this is Westminster Hall facing south as it looked in the late 19th century. So this part at the far end is this part right here. So you'd go enter here and each side, and they would often meet at the same time. On this side, notice on the right-hand side here is where the Court of Chancery would meet. The left-hand side is where the Court of King's Bench would meet. The Court of Common Pleas met here, sort of around here. It's hard to show on this man, this picture. And then off a little doorway is the exchequer chamber where this is where they have the exchequer table the audits are done and over here essentially right to the entrance you take a right turn and you go to the exchequer court this is where the exchequer of pleas are held this is saint stephen's cloister and saint stephen's court which has nothing to do with anything but the later court of wards would uh also be held here beyond this uh, wonderful window. And then of course the House of Commons will be held over to the left side. The Court of King's Bench was essentially fixed at Westminster Hall. So they are fixed at Westminster Hall from 1318 sitting at the southeast end, as I showed you in the previous map, in a space marked off by a wooden bar, 
the justices on a raised bench on one side of the bar, which again is what you see here. These would be the justices, the attorneys and later barristers on the other. This would be the bar, the court. This is a different one. This is where the, uh, well, all the miscreants are being held, if you notice that. This is a attorney, one of the counters. Here's another one here. These are the robes you would wear. Notice this is a defendant. He's got chains on his feet. And this is one of the court's bailiffs. And the clerks here are sitting at a large table covered in green cloth. The King's Bench, and here is again the courts at Westminster Hall, 1750. By this point, they had put up this screen to separate the courts, which are on the other side, from all the attorneys, everyone just milling about on this side. Anyway, the King's Bench was headed by the Chief Justice of the King's Bench, usually abbreviated as the CJKB and staffed by a varying number of justices who heard largely criminal violations of the king's peace, plus any non-revenue matters involving the king. The Court of King Bench also acted as a court of appeals for the Exchequer of Pleas, the Court of Common Pleas, the Heirs, the Assizes, and the County Courts though final appeal could always be made to Parliament, essentially to the House of Lords. Second to the King's Bench was the Court of Common Pleas. And here's a picture of a justice carrying the case. And on the other side of the bar is, of course, two attorneys. I should say two counters, my mistake. Court of Common Pleas would deal with civil disputes only and only between free men. So it's not about free man versus serf. Certainly no serfs would hold the case. So only civil disputes, but not those, any of those held or heard in the court's Christians. Say, for example, trespass, libel, uh, slander, libel, all those were in the uh, court's Christian. Nor did the Court of Common pleas hear any cases, anything that had to do with the king or the king's peace. So nothing about debts owed the king or any criminal actions. The court at first traveled about with the king as part of the Curia Regis, the king's court, but from 1216 onwards, as required by Magna Carta, it was fixed at Westminster Hall in London, headed by a different Chief Justice, the Chief Justice of Common Pleas, or the CJCP, and three to five other justices. There was no particularly fixed number. At Westminster Hall, Common Pleas sat in a room off the east side of the hall, and again, you can say this in action, Chancery Court here, King's Bench here. This looks at uh, various court records on this side. Again, you can't quite see it, but right about here would be the Court of Common Pleas. Anyway, east side, the justices, again, on a raised bench on one side of the bar, the sergeants at law or the counters on the other, the court officer sitting at a large oak table covered in green cloth off to the side. The Exchequer of Pleas, next in importance to Common Pleas, was headed by five barons of the Exchequer. So here they are here. This would be one chief baron. And these are the four subordinates who met in the room off Westminster Hall, again shown in that previous map, and at first dealt only with debts due the king, who was represented by the Attorney General. And again, these are the clerks. Uh, this is, well, these are the various attorneys here and here. And it looks like another one here. Those without a coif seem to be mostly plaintiffs or defendants.
But in the 13th century, jurisdiction of the Exchequer of Pleas was enlarged to allow the king's debtors to sue and collect on debts owed them by others that they might better pay the king. And thus, it became a court of both common law and equity. From 1280, the chancellor heard petitions seeking justice in matters not covered by the common law because of the odd way in which the king's jurisdiction had developed. And by 1330, this turned into the Court of Chancery in Westminster Hall, again sitting at the southwest end, formerly led by the chancellor and aided by chancery clerks. Again, there is no medieval picture of the Court of Chancery in session. This is from uh, the Court of Chancery in session in 1720. This, of course, would have been the green cloth table with the various clerks. This would be the, well, originally it would have been the chancer, chancellor alone. And these, the various people having cases before it. Chancery followed equity. These are somewhat loose rules designed to either address cases not actionable at common law. In other words, you cannot bring a case in any other court or to avoid injustices which might result from the slow pace of the common law courts. People complain today about the slow course, the slow pace of court system today in America and England, but back then, in fact, there was one case which dragged out, one case over a century long. Anyway, equity, a case which might result from the slow pace of the common law courts, both through the use of injunctions or what's called specific performance. Along with all cases involving trust, property of lunatics, and guardianship of infants. And I do say lunatics because that is the term, the legal term used. Next to the central courts in Westminster were the general heirs. Notice E-Y-R-R-E. It's not ire, it's heir. General heirs established under King Henry II to preserve public order in the countryside. With 20 to 30 of the king's justices assigned to hear all cases, civil and criminal, that had occurred since the last heir had taken place in that county. But at least once every seven years, at least originally that was the plan. When the heir arrived, everyone, and I do mean everyone in the county, had to attend along with all current and former local officials, which begat fear and awe in the local populace. And the justices in air, as you might see here, inquired into all crimes and sudden deaths, the business and affairs of local officials, the feudal and fiscal rights of the crown, private disputes, etc., you name it, using a grand jury. the cumbersome nature of the heirs led to greater and greater intervals between visits, and they fell into general disuse by the year 1300. So, in response, special commissions were issued to individual justices to hold specialized inquiries into criminal activity in a series of commissions known as, well, one would be the Articles of Trail Baston. Another is a commission of Oye and Termine, in other words, to hear and determine. And then, of course, commissions of jail delivery to deliver prisoners from the jails. At the local level, the most important courts were the courts of assize, where various numbers of the king's justices heard capital cases on the old seven heir circuits. 
They were also given the right to hear civil disputes by commissions of assize and commissions of Nisi Prius, and criminal cases by commissions of Oye et Termine and jail delivery. From 1388, below the assize courts were the courts of quarter sessions, which were held four times a year, hence quarter. These were held at Epiphany, Easter, Midsummer Day, and Michaelmas. Again, remember Michaelmas, September 29th, in each county, dealing with crimes that could not be summarily tried by a single justice of the peace, and so each of these quarter session courts were presided over by at least three justices of the peace and a jury of 12 Franklins, 12 free men. A meeting monthly and presided over by the sheriff was the county court dealing with offenses against the king's peace along with all civil disputes not subject to the court's Christian, the church courts, and claims up to two pounds in value, which in 2020 purchasing power would be 40 million pounds or $55,290,000. Uh, in other words, a huge, just about every single claim you can think of. Below the county court was the hundred court in each hundred, dealing with all disputes and crimes involving Franklins and villains. In other words, a case between, well, a case of two Franklins would go to the king's courts, a Franklin and two uh, villains, two serfs in the manor courts, between a free peasant and a serf peasant, the case of the dispute would be held in the hundred court. By 1234, hundred courts were held every three weeks, where a petty jury of 12 of the peasant elite decided misdemeanors, because anything more a felony, and a misdemeanor was usually um, defined as any matter in which the penalty was a fine or no more than a year and year and a day in prison. Anything else was a felony. So anything, if you're accused of a felony, this would have gone to the sheriff's turn at Easter or Michaelmas, and then followed by a trial either in the quarter sessions or at the assizes. Got that? Don't worry if you don't. It's confusing to everybody. I think if you were a peasant, you were an Englishman, you would have grown up understanding this. The rest of us is like, huh? At the very bottom were the manorial courts. These were held again every three weeks. These dealt with disputes usually between a lord's free and billing tenants. So if you're a free Franklin, and you do not uh, hold any land or work any land that belongs to a lord on his manor, in other words, the land you own is yours entirely, that would go to the hundred courts. Or if you are a free man and a villain in one manner, and then uh, dispute is over uh, somebody in the other manner, which might be just across the street, that would go again to the hundred court. Anyway, disputes between a lord's free and serf tenants while enforcing the dues and obligations, so all the fines of all the dues and obligations owed by serfs were enforced to the manorial court. The manorial court also dealt with land transfers between the peasantry the common fields, nuisances, rentals, chariots, boon work, merche, tithe, whatever, all presided over by the Lord's steward 
and a petty jury of 12, both free and villain, culled from the peasant elite. Some manors and some towns also had a court leet, so L-E-E-T as you see here, which met once or twice a year, mostly to regulate the price, quality, and the measure of bread and ale and other foodstuffs, to guard against the adulteration of food, to inspect weights and measures, and in general, to look into the morals of the local people. There is also a court of pie powder, as you see here, kind of an unusual name. These were specialized, very specialized town courts with unlimited jurisdiction over all personal actions for events taking place, but only in a market or fair. Example, theft, fraud, violence, mercantile disputes. These would be held in front of the mayor and the bailiffs which would provide speedy justice. So a merchant at a fair is not gonna wanna stick around for six months or a year. He's got business elsewhere. And he may not come back for a while, hard to say. So instead of waiting, they have this court, which the dispute is held there and then. Same with the marketplace. Now, those who lost their case in the court of pie powder Either a merchant had declared like he had stolen uh, or something had happened, somebody had hit him or stolen from him and he's lying, or the actual thief, of course. If you lost the case, you could be fined, put in a pillory, publicly shamed by being driven around town in a tumbrel, or seizure and loss of property. Notice uh, you do not have body parts cut off nor are you hanged for this. The wrap-up quote. The justices of King's Bench shall have cognizance of amending false judgments and of determining appeals and other pleas of trespass committed against the King's peace. There shall be justices of common pleas at Westminster to determine common pleas according to royal writ. At the exchequer at Westminster, the royal treasurers and barons of the exchequer have jurisdiction and record of things which concern their office, and to hear and determine all causes relating to the king's debts and things incident thereto, without which such matters could not be tried and that they have cognizance of debts owing to the debtors of the king's debtors. John de Britton, 1290. So, let me know what you think of this quote in the comment section below. Also, what you liked about this video, and what other historical topics or subjects you'd like to see in future videos. Be sure to click like, share, especially subscribe, as it will help me bring you more great videos and click on that little bell thingy so you'll know when the next History Waits for No One video is posted. If you want to know more, there are recommended studies on this topic in the description below, along with other ways to connect with me. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the past.